Uh, this is the build OGM call for Tuesday, October 12th, 2021. Well, I'm pleased you have connectivity back and that means your connectivity is much fancier and faster and better, right? In theory, yeah. At least uh, it's better than it was. And uh, I mean, it was always pretty good in my office, but we have a house which is four floors and my the router comes in on my office, which is the fourth floor. And the house is made of heavy reinforced concrete. So we also now have connectivity in each of the other floors, which was important. Did you need like a repeater in each floor? Uh, we're doing it at the moment with two yeah. uh, repeaters and hopefully it'll get down to one repeater. Uh, and also some, uh, don't know the right English word for it, but the Dutch word is a klungel. Is that, that sounds like a special secret term, uh, technical part. Yes, klungel. That someone who klungels along and uh, does everything ass backwards and so, uh, the last people we had in the house, they were Klungles, and uh, they connected the internet and the with the dimmers of our lamps. Oh no! So every, every time there was a dimmer, and you use the dimmer, it squeezed the internet connection. Could you imagine? <laughs> anyway, that's just so weird. That's just so weird. We have. Um, we have uh, LifeX bulbs, and uh, uh, which are one of the brand. Philips makes a. I'm forgetting what they're called, uh, but there's a couple smart bulbs. So we have LifeX. Yeah, singles. I like it. Um, and so we can speak our lights to different colors and on and off and all that kind of stuff through our, you know, and they're connected through Wi-Fi, but they don't yeah. interfere with our connection. They're just they're just hanging out waiting for us to say something. Yeah. That sounds good. That yeah. sounds really good. And then, and then we have both Alexa and uh, Google Assistant. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and so these are automated through Google Assistant. The Alexa has turned out to be mostly a kitchen timer. Like, <laughs> like I, I use it, you know, or an exercise timer, like, <laughs> hey, two minutes for this stretch. Um, and then we use Google for everything else. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's fun, the number of things Google can do. I mean. Can, can it? work at a distance for example can you be a couple of miles away and ask google to do it so i have a so i have an android phone and so when i i can say hey google yeah and my phone will wake up and say what do you what do you want me to do and, yeah. and this and the assistant that is on here is exactly the same assistant that is on the google assistant device aha uh -huh. uh -huh. so 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 yes um, I, I haven't tried like home control from far away, but I think I could. I'm not sure. It, it may know that I'm in the room or not in the room, and it may gate my ability to like turn the lights on, but it shouldn't. And there's actually there's also a LifeX app, and I'm pretty sure that from anywhere in the world, I could I could like make April go crazy at home by just switching the lights to like Halloween mode, carnival mode, flashing mode, haunted house mode, uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Sounds really good. Yeah. So do you have Bixby on your phone? That's who I have on my phone. I don't even know Bixby. So are you on a Samsung phone? Yeah, I'm on a Samsung phone. So Sam Bixby is Samsung's version of Siri, uh, Alexa, and Google Assistant. Right. Okay. And so I've yeah. never had I've never owned any Samsung hardware. I've never bought a Samsung phone or anything. Oh, yeah. I'm uh, the last 10 years I'm more or less stable with Samsung. And so uh, Samsung, is, Samsung is Android plus Samsung's software, right? Yes. <laughs> right. And I've, I've got uh, not the, the latest one is a fold, folding phone. I don't have that. But I have the phone that they brought out a year ago, which has fantastic cameras. Like the cameras, cameras. yes. Yeah, must be really good. Uh, good. Good battery life, uh, really good uh, screen uh, colors. And so, so I'm, and, and it's still fits in my pocket it's a big screen but it fits in my pocket so i'm pretty pretty pleased with that that's yeah good. that's great stacy are you android iphone i'm android I'm, I'm samsung and the i hear people saying what a great camera and i think it's the worst camera ever really? but 
but I also didn't even know what Bixby was. Like I see it there. Like I close off a lot of my apps because I'm just paranoid. And I'm wondering if maybe I have something closed that would affect the camera. Maybe. Um, but the I don't the camera, on, like if you open, there should be a default camera app. And if you open that, you should be taking really good pictures. Just the default settings on the Samsung phone should give you good photos. That's weird. Yeah. I've had excellent, uh, this is my fourth Samsung phone. Uh, and all of them have been progressively better. But even the, the, the first one of 10 years ago made great photos. Huh. Oh. Well, I mean, I'm talking about when I'm taking pictures in the dark. Like like of lights on the bridge or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So it's horrible. <laughs> oh, oh, too bad. Too bad. That's I mean, great. I'm not a really great fiddler with settings, but I do think there's lots of settings you can fiddle with, like oh. night views and uh, long exposures and stuff like that. I will have to conkle with them. Clungle yeah. with them. You can clungle. Clungle. Yeah. <laughs> clungle <laughs> with them. <laughs> And, and one way to do that is just go on YouTube and say Sam, Samsung, you know, Samsung take better pictures or something like that. And very yeah. likely you'll find some people with tutorials and with some examples. It's like insane how many people have put like instructional videos on YouTube. The one thing that I do love about it is it has a really easy way of sharing things. Like if I like really easy, like I wish everything yep. had it. It gives me a choice if I want to copy it to my clipboard or if I want to email it yep. or message it or, you know, all these different things. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that on my computer. Yeah. Do you want to share it with the NSA? Do you want to email it to Putin? Do you want like anything? Anything is possible. Well, not even that. Like right now, <laughs> let's say I had, um, if I was on my phone, if I was on a Zoom call on my phone, I would have no trouble sending you something from that I got off of Facebook and putting it in the chat. But on my computer, you see how much trouble, which by the way, when you get off, check your messenger because I sent you something you had asked for. I don't even remember what it was. Oh, okay. But I put it there because I couldn't find any other way to get it to. Oh, I know. Right. It, was, it was Daniel Schmachtenberger's post. I put oh, it in thank your messenger. You. Thank well, you. So messenger, you mean Facebook messenger? Correct. Okay, good. I, and I haven't opened Facebook yet, so uh, it's like a, a queue, a queue of things I've got to go, you know, check for the daily rounds. We all no. make the daily rounds, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> the biggest. You mean that? You mean that figuratively, right? There's no yeah, place yeah. called. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. The daily, the daily rounds in the sense of you go to LinkedIn, you, you check the updates, you check messages, you go to Facebook, you check yeah. the others, you go to your, you go to your email, of course, and there's like a torrent of stuff in there. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just email. Facebook, Zoom, that's that's just a triangle. But the one thing that's really lacking is like a virtual bookshelf for me where oh. I could just, you know, put, you know, like let's say I come across memes that I think, oh, I can think of a project where I will want to use all these, all these great memes. I used to right. use my, I used to use my page as my sort of library that I knew I'd always be able to yeah. go back to. And then that, proved to be dangerous. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It makes you too vulnerable for people to know things. You know, it's just, yeah, it's just yeah. not good. It's too public. Um, but it would be great to, when I first saw the brain, the way yeah. I, I was looking at it slightly different. I was seeing the human as the center of that page. And I was seeing, you know, the different parts of their lives and thinking that I could put my stuff in the different places where it related. Right. You mean and in the brain? In the brain. And like I visualized everybody having their own page of the brain. So right. if I went over, let's say I already- I wish. Did, but, <laughs> uh, but, that's, but that's really how I see it, like more human centered. So that if I know I really resonate with Hank, I really like him. I wanna see who he's hanging around because there's a good chance I might, you know, click with those people too. Yeah. That's yeah. basically how I used Facebook in the early days. Sure. It was very, very helpful. An sure, algorithm sure. couldn't have done that for me because an algorithm couldn't have seen that warm data. Right. And also we, we usually mostly make our friends networks visible on Facebook. So you can actually scroll through. If there's somebody you like, you can scroll through and see who they're friends with and then friend some of them, those people up. And that works really nicely. 
well, but that's see, it works really nicely for a well-meaning individual. Yeah. But it is extremely dangerous, which is yeah. why my friends list is private. Right. right. Exactly. And I don't no, I don't accept request even if I know, you know, if I see somebody, unless I speak to them, I won't and I feel badly, but I won't no. accept the request because it's just it's just not good. I learned the yeah. hard way. It's not good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And we need to mind our privacy. Um, so two services you might want to consider. Uh, Pinterest is the one that many people use for keeping their own personal, hey, I'm going to want to refer to this later. And sometimes mm -hmm. people create their own private pin boards. You don't have to share your pin boards. Um, so Pinterest might be useful to you. And then Factor is Michael Grossman's platform. It's actually elegant. It lets you take news and other kinds of items and add some, I think you can add tags to them. You can share them with other people if you want, but you know, a few of us are, are in factor. I'm not using it regularly because I use the brain all the time. Like, like, you know, there's a bunch of stuff I don't, I don't use because I'm, I'm so invested in the brain, but you might want to play with factor for a second and just see if it does this, this library thing for you. Is there a recording where Michael did a deep dive of how factor worked? Uh, we can ask, we can ask Michael. I don't know. I, I can't think of one. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So, so let's do a little bit of OGM building, shall we? Yeah, good idea. Um, cool. Um, and thank you for for all of that. That that's just like my brain is now relaxing into our into our space. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, despite all the talk of Bixby and klugling, klungling. <laughs> um, so there, so there's progress, progress is happening, uh, on tomorrow's, uh, call at the same hour, uh, we'll go into, uh, weaving the world and all that kind of stuff, but, but I'm moving ahead on that. I've, uh, I've got some, uh, a bunch of things still missing to, to be done, but, uh, one of the things I think that needs to be finalized tomorrow is when is the first call and what is the rhythm and all of that kind of stuff, but we'll leave that sort of for tomorrow. Um, yesterday, Pete and I had a really nice session where uh, part of the funding that came from Jim Rutt's family foundation is for two tiles to fund two um, little projects that fit into the big mosaic of what OGM sees is needed in the world. And so yesterday, Pete and I started framing up because everything is a project apparently. Um, uh, we started framing up a project plan for, uh, we called it Krav. Uh, and I'm sworn to secrecy about why we named it that because every project needs a, a funny little name. So Project Crop basically describes automating as much as possible uh, recordings that come off of Zoom, Zoom calls. So we're starting with just that and then figuring out how much can we automate the production of those recordings into a series of different assets. So one asset, you know, and I do this, I do this now all manually and minimally. Right, so I take the Zoom uh, video recording and I just upload it to uh, YouTube. And I don't, unless unless there was like a, you know, on, on the Thursday calls because it turns on as soon as the first person shows up in the room. Sometimes there's a thirty minute tail on the front of the Thursday calls yeah, yeah. that I have to go and cut off, right? Because yeah. I I don't really want. And sometimes there's a nice two people chatting who got yeah. there early sort of thing, but I try to cut those off. But but cutting them off is a bit of a chore because. I don't want to pull the video into an editor. I do it in YouTube Studio. And YouTube Studio, for some reason, decides to completely redo the video. As soon as you trim it, the trimming is a little awkward to do. You're not quite sure you're doing the right thing. And then it takes forever to redo the video and get it back up, mm -hmm. but it works, but, but it works. And then I don't do anything with the audio file. I don't, I don't do anything with the chat file. Um, we've, we've failed to move our chat over to Mattermost chat. So that's not working very well. I only get a transcript for the Thursday calls because we're using Collective Next's uh, slightly pricier uh, version of Zoom there, uh, et cetera. And then um, I don't create a new web page for every call, but I but I annotate everything in my brain. So I'm I'm busy doing sort of uh, weaving, world weaving in my brain every time that I'm on a call. And I, I don't know if you, I think both of you might've been on the call, but uh, there was a call recently where I was like, you know, if Mark Carranza or I uh, am on a, are, are on a call, then a natural byproduct of that call will be us weaving into our the tool of preference for us, 
like what we heard and what, what you know what's going on the call. And for Mark, it's MX, and it's, most of his data is private. He's but he's shifting around uh, quite a bit now. He's starting to think that that he'd like to experiment more in public, which is great, which is actually fantastic. And he's got a version of my my exported brain that I think he's trying to absorb into MX. Uh, and we'll we'll see how that works. And and uh, the tools are different enough that I'm not sure that there's a comfortable fit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, we're trying to figure out how to automate. Um, with Pete, uh, lots of stretches of the production process because to have a pretty podcast, it needs to have an intro and an outro. It needs to be edited some along the way. Yeah. All yeah. of that is time consuming. Um, uh, but then there's things like Descript. Uh, are you guys familiar with Descript? I'm not, no. Uh, let me find the proper URL. Uh, so Pete found this and it's quite brilliant. It costs money, which I don't have quite budget for yet, but this is, uh, it works for podcasts, for audio and video podcasts, and here's the URL to the company. And, um, and what Descript does is it, it automatically creates a transcript of your recording. All right, cool. Mm -hmm. then, yeah. then you can edit the transcript. And if you cut a sentence out of the transcript, it cuts a sentence out of the recording and edits it nicely. Um, you can then move words around in the transcript and it'll move the sounds properly in the recording. You can, it also has a command to take out all the ums, ers, ors, and the long pauses. And it will trim those out of the recording and pretty those up automatically. Um, it even has a deal with a company called Lyrebird. And this is going to creep you out a little bit, uh, but it has a company, it has a deal with a company called Lyrebird and you can type in new dialogue tell it whose voice to make that in, and it will speak that dialogue into the recording as if that person were saying it. It's, it's, this is a, like, like super smart. That part of it is a little deep fake and a little, a little wacky, yes. but, it might, might, but it might come in useful if you meant to say something or if you have something unintelligible that you need to sort of add something in. Yeah, uh, yeah, but but anyway, so so at some point in the future, we may get a Descript account and use it to shorten uh, some of the work in the middle here. Um, but anyway, so so I'm working. Uh, sorry for the long story, but but I'm uh, so Pete and I more or less have the first piece of the first tile uh, in process, and and I'm going to fund what we're going to fund is his investigating all the different moving parts and completing the plan. Uh, and then if, if that all looks good, then we'll basically fund the rest of it, which is writing the software and then putting in the software will, will mostly be a series of scripts that get ex executed. So a script, uh, Stacy could say, uh, take the file from here, do this thing to it, filter it, and then put it over here. Uh, or, you know, um, well, there's lots of different things or submit this file automatically to Amazon uh, Amazon has its own speech recognition system. So AWS, Amazon Web Services, has a speech recognition function among the million things it knows how to do, uh, which is which is sort of cheaper because you just sort of pay by the recording. It's cheaper than getting a monthly account on one of these other services like Otter. Uh, uh, the other really good uh, transcription service is Otter. Um, and the reason that Zoom creates good transcripts if you pay for them is that they have a deal with Otter. So the, 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 so the speech transcription, um, te uh, speech to text uh, behind Zoom is Otter. So I get Otter for free. What, why is that? I don't know, from where? From Otter. <laughs> from, um, I have like an Otter account from like two years ago. Oh, interesting. And you're not paying anything for it. Do you use it to transcribe stuff? Um, I ha back then I did. And then recently I tried once and then I was, I was doing something. I was distracted. Let's just put uh, it that way. Yeah. Uh, Cause it could be that you had a free account early and they started charging it. I mean, it could be that they've morphed. I don't know, but I don't know that Otter has a free setting maybe. Huh. It was, I mean, it was, maybe it was, I mean, I was, yeah. You know what? Let me look into it and then I'll tell okay. you exactly. Cool. Cool. What it is. Yeah, so there's increasingly all these tools out there. And what we want to do is, is make it so that the production of nice audio and video artifacts, including um, uh, web pages for these sorts of things, works uh, seamlessly. Um, yeah. And let me screen share for a second because uh, Rat Dunbar, um, on, on Jim Rat's suggestion, I guess I've got us, well, that's weird.
Let me spell everything right. Here's the Jim Rutt show. Uh, here's episode 140. Oh, Dumb Around Friendship. Okay, I didn't have both of their names. Anyway, um, on Jim Rutt's suggestion, because it seemed topical and it was a good example, I listened to this episode of, uh, of the Jim Rutt show. And let me just go to the page. Um, and uh, on the, the like, here's episode 140 of the Jim Rutt show, which is his interview with Robert Dunbar, uh, fam famous up for the Dunbar number. Here's the audio of the file. And then there's a very nice transcript. There's a, there's a, uh, a, a briefing up top, sort of a, a thing. And then, uh, episode transcript, you click here, and all of a sudden, you have the full text of the show, nicely edited. Yeah. So as much as possible, here, Jim, today's guest is Robin Dunbar. Robin, no, great to be here. This looks like a really cleaned up transcript, right? Um, yeah. And then with a little warning at the top, hey, uh, this is not a, a completely edited transcript, it's a rough transcript. So that, that's good. So the people know that it hasn't been edited through. But then I listened to this podcast, which is an hour and five minutes, and this is what I did, note taking with that recording, right? And so, and 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 um, partly because I'm going to do a lot of this for weaving the world and for everything else, partly to understand better and describe better how much and what role my brain plays in all of this. And so, for example, um, these are these are notes that I took from well, actually quotes that I copied and pasted in my brain from the call, but, but um, Stacy, this is my bookshelf, but this is my bookshelf and my moleskin, right? Uh, so, so I actually sort of, I take notes in here as well, not complete notes of a, of a call, but I'm, I'm, I'm really pretty much note taking in here. So, uh, you know, we invest very heavily in five core shoulders to cry on friends. Uh, uh, the book that, that we're talking about here is uh, so the, the book that Dunbar recently published is called Friends, Understanding the Power of Our Most Important Relationships. Uh, and in there, uh, one of the things that comes up in the podcast is, and I think I showed this yesterday, um, the seven pillars of friendship. And, you know, sharing the same sense of humor is number six. And what I didn't do yet, which I can do now, is say sense of humor, which I know I have in the brain. Uh, and doesn't have a web page. I mean, I'm, that isn't connected to like a Wikipedia page, which I should do. Um, <clears throat> and so now my computer's fan has kicked in. Man, uh, there we go. And so now I've connected one of his seven pillars of friendship to senses and sense of humor isn't connected to humor. Wow, this is really like a backwater. Um, and there's humor. I need to go back in here after our call and clean this up. Uh, but here's, you know, I've, I've now connected directly into humor. So here's uh, types of humor, the eight patterns of humor, the devil's dictionary, uh, whimsy, parodies, jokes, cringe comedy, cringe comedy should take us to the office. Uh, here's the original office and here's the American version of the office, et cetera, et cetera. Here's Ali G. If you haven't watched Ali G, you should watch Ali G. So, so I'm doing this just to show that this is also the kind of asset that, that Weaving the World is going to create alongside all those other assets. So the more we can automate the creation of all these things, the better, because because right now the, this, uh, uh, oh, Otters Feed for the first 600 minutes? The first, wow, really, 10 hours? That's what it says. <laughs> well, gosh darn, that's monthly or the first 600 ever? Monthly? monthly. It said month the free basic subscription is the simplest available and enables users to record up to 600 minutes of audio per month. That Sweet. was March 2020. Okay, good. So I should be using it more. Um, thank you. I uh, appreciate that. So, um, so anyway, all that to say that there's now a tile that, that's moving into place uh, to start building out a piece of the, the software that we need in order to... Um, deconstruct uh, events like calls, uh, turn them into useful assets, and then mine those assets into like the mind map I just showed, and then a bunch of other things, right? So, so yep. Hank, if there, was a, if there was a small population of positive cartographers who wanted to tackle all these things and, and see what they were, we would be feeding them lots of raw materials to go, to go do their cartography, for example, yep. right? In lots for of- For example, places. yeah, exactly. <clears throat> just, right, to ahead, make sure, just to yeah. make sure I'm clear. Yes. So, the, the project itself is 
writing the list of what needs to happen? Like, uh, I'm, I just. So at the, um, at the end of Pete doing this Krav project, um, at the end of it, there will be a series of scripts that I will be able to use that will be also in, in the open source you know, there, will be, there will be on our GitHub repo that anybody could go use that will automate the steps to download and then process and then re-upload. You know, I would love it if at the end of the day, um, the, uh, the video file was edited and uploaded to YouTube, the audio file was downloaded and, and edited and uploaded to Anchor. I mean, you know, this is, and if both were uploaded to the Internet Archive, for example, automatically, uh, it'd be fantastic if all that were done. The very likely result is there will be some intermediate steps where humans have to do some stuff, right? Yeah. But, but that set of scripts is what, we're, is what Pete is going to write and he's also going to document them. Yep. Right, so that someone else could come in and go, oh, okay. And, and we're going to do not the all singing, all dancing version of this, but we're going to assume that the recording is coming from Zoom, for example. Right, because there's lots of other ways you could off, you could you could create a recording. There's lots of formats that could show up, and we are not doing you know uh, that whole wide input funnel. We're doing this this limited version, so somebody else could pick up this code, by the way, uh, and then they could add a oh I've I've just added like a front end so that this thing will now uh, talk to a bunch of other platforms as input. That'd be that'd be yeah. fantastic. And if they contributed that that back, then we've made that little body of open source software better, and somebody else you know, created a little tile that fits in front of Pete's tile. That's metaphorically what's going on here. Does that make sense? Yes. It does. Thank you. Awesome. awesome. And then lather, rinse, repeat is the idea. Uh, and then on Monday's uh, Free Jury's Brain Call, Hank, you would have been, you would have, you would have enjoyed Monday's call. I'm uh, sorry yeah. you were stuck with, with Klungles. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, um, so the first half of, of the Free Jury Spring call was like one of the, one of our one of our doom reveries um, oh, yeah. because I I sort of I opened the call having read a couple of doom like articles but we so we spent a half hour kind of on so what on earth do we do and then we shifted into okay so what does it actually mean to Free Jury's Brain and then it turned out that you know we had four technical people on the call um, and they had really different opinions about how to go about liberating my brain. And, and Stacy yeah. and I were like the, 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 the non-geeks on the call going, whoa, that's interesting. I don't, Stacey, I don't know what your reaction was. Mine was like, oh man, okay, we kind of have to sort this out. So my reaction was kind of interesting because a name, for, first of all, I just wish that there was somebody that had this technical experience, but that was female. Because I really was curious to see if some other yeah. part would be brought in. That that was really what I sat there thinking the whole time. And a name did come to mind, but I don't really know the person, so I don't know why that name was coming to mind. Yeah. But I'll share it with you after. Okay. <laughs> I okay. did share it with Pete because I wound up talking to Pete later on. Yeah, and we have some geeks in the crowd. Like Christina Bowen is very technical. That was the name. That there was we, the name, and I was going to ask you if you had spoken to her just to get her opinion. So um, I haven't talked with her in a while. Uh, 2018, I did a bunch of work with Christina and we, we were all trying to stand up a little consultancy that did stuff. And it, it, we, we, it didn't sort of all come together, but she's still doing things in, the, in that realm. Um, and I haven't talked with her about, you know, free jury's brain at all. Like, I don't, I don't think that's even coming to conversation, but I could. And, and that was my intuitive thing. It didn't come yeah. from anything. But, but her, but she then she then works with other geeks like Philip Pidmore Brown and a bunch of others to actually to to do a bunch of coding. So so she's really geeky, but she actually uses other geeks to to code stuff. Well, and my but my thought was because I was trying to figure out why am I getting her name like why, and then you know after talking to Pete, I realized maybe it's just as simple as she would know somebody else to connect yeah, you yeah, or yeah. Oh, yeah. one of those kinds exactly. Of things. And then um, there's a couple other geeks in OGM who are women um, like Wendy Elford is very geeky, um, but I think not in a build your website kind of way, but in a text analysis and processing kind of way. So she uses something called Leximancer, uh, which is a very advanced tool for processing large bodies of text and making sense out of them in some way. I don't actually know all the features it has, but she's, she runs very geeky on that. And I don't know in what other sort of, in, a, in what other senses she, she does that, but um, you know, the thing that I notice all the time is that 
the, the kind of mind that creates the text is not necessarily the same mind that's going to be using it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that, you know, there needs to be more bridging there. Yep. Yep. Um, exactly. Uh, so, so, so some of these pieces are starting to sort of come, come into view and, and be connected. Um, we have some funding to start a show. Uh, I need to figure out the relationship between the main episodes of the show and what to call and how to frame yeah. the weaving, the weaving episodes that, that yeah. like weave the big fungus. Like, um, I think my default setting right now is that those are all episodes of Weaving the World, that there's not like two podcasts, there's just one, uh, but that the episodes of, of Weaving that, that are post-processing are bonus episodes or special episodes or behind the curtain episodes or something something like that, right? Yeah. Um, and, then, and then I think they have two different intros. I think that um, I'm busy creating some text, which I will share into the uh wtw ops um channel shortly because they're just too thin right now but i'm creating sort of intro and outro texts to have scripts to record once uh, so that these things get just put on uh, the front and back of each of the recordings and i think that the ones that are post-processing need to have a okay uh, you know this is one of, in a in a series of whatever we call these things where we take the last episode and, and go and sort of melt it and rework it and connect it up and, and riff on it with several different visualization tools to try to build this larger connective, uh, collective memory. Yeah. Something like that. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, and there's a few more pieces I've got to kind of put in place to, to do the first episode, but I think we're, I'm kind of ready to start doing maybe like two episodes a week. Um, and by episodes, I sort of mean, an, a primary episode and its follow-up. It's it's post-processing. Any thoughts you have on language to use about whether I call these behind the curtain or weaving itself or like all thoughts welcome on on how to frame that. Say the first part of the question. I didn't really hear the. I don't sure. really know the answer. So there's so there's primary episodes, and then there's the episodes where we just pay attention only to what got said in the primary episode, and then take it deeper and uh, you know weave it into the big fungus, so mm -hmm. to speak, mulch it up, compost it. Um, I could even call them like composting episodes or something like that, you know, because composting does work with big fungus. That's you know close enough natural metaphor that uh, uh, that that could work, but. Um, uh, or metabolizing the first ones. That's not good. That's not felicitous. Um, but I'm trying to figure out what's, what's the language that nicely describes the work of the, the post-processing. And then there's always the phrase, we'll fix it in post, which applies very narrowly to movie making, where you, you, know, you just edit and, and do stuff to the, the film you captured to, to enhance, correct, whatever. That's not quite the right metaphor here. In my perfect world, that episode, rather than being um, streamlined, streamline, would sprout <laughs> into yeah. different episodes. And it, it very potentially could. And what I'm realizing is, let's pretend we talk to Tyson Jungaporta or Daniel Schmarkenberger or whatever. Um, we're not going to solve everything in a couple hours of conversation or a couple hours of post-processing. This thing could easily fragment and get, you know, go, uh, go Hydra on us in lots of fruitful ways. Um, and, and to encompass that and set expectations, I think a piece of what the intro needs to say, which is what I'm working on to put in the script is, um, and by the way, we're just trying to take bites out of all this. We are not going to map all of human knowledge by ourselves on this little podcast, but we're going to do, we're going to behave in a way that helps us do it all collectively with the rest of you. So if you're inspired to do this kind of, this kind of stuff, like, please like get in touch, uh, come join us. We're, tr we're trying to take all, we're trying to make all of our materials as useful to you as possible. Do you know what the first one is going to be? Not not necessarily the guest, but the. Um... Um, not sure. I think that the, among the first few, um, uh, Mila and Joe and Amber uh, were on a call recently where we, we there was like a, a, a setting. So I I sent them an email saying, "Hey, would you like to sort of 
organize like a, an early, early, early call in the sequence. And they were like, yes. And Mila was looking for something that's actually sort of very much about weaving and very emergent. Without I don't know who any of them are. Yeah. And, and um, they've been on some of our other calls. Uh, I think they were on the flotilla call. I'm trying to remember which call all of us were on where this conversation came up when I was like this, let's do, let's do this as a call. So, so that's going to be one of the earliest calls um, on, on purpose to bring you know, a feminine energy in. But what is the subject? Like, well, I don't know. I don't know um, them. So what is their what, focus? I, I think it's sort of uh, the feminine uh, and I'm going to phrase it poorly here. But the, the feminine effects aspects side of this weaving act, what, it, what, is, what, is, what, what do we mean by weaving? And what emergent wisdom do we have on the topic? Where does it take us? Okay, so putting that into practice, which I'd like to think that's what I try to do. Um, when I was just looking into things and just coincidentally, I reached out to a friend that hasn't been very active, but I thought she'd be really good for this project. Uh, she's just brilliant and she knows some of the people here and she's connected to the indigenous populations and whatever, but we're actually going to talk later, but Sweet. I realized that there are other groups that are trying to do exactly this. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be perfect to start with a call with them and weave, weave right there because then you're weaving in yeah, all, yeah. You know, everything. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Um, and and in some sense, anybody doing a nice podcast like Jim Rutz that I just showed you is doing some of this work because they're leaving behind a great artifact. And and I, I realized just in, in post-processing that podcast that I could have a lifetime of unpaid employment um, processing all of the good episodes of other people's shows that are already in the world. Right, that there's there's like this endless supply of good materials like that created by individuals or other communities. So I think finding a community that's doing this kind of work together, that's excited about like like the the, the common work would be perfect. And I want to say, Stan, I want to, I hope it doesn't sound terrible, but it, I I really do want to say it. It's been on my mind. The difference is finding the community that's looking to do this is really bringing a different, um, they have a whole different mindset because what I see a lot are, you know, men who, not, and it's not just men. There's a school that wants to promote themselves. They may be really good people, but at the core, they want to promote themselves. Right. So all through Facebook, when I'm getting all these sponsored things, they're looking to promote themselves. And while I understand there's a need, people have to eat, that mentality is not the best one to seed the birth of something new. Right. And I think it goes to sort of when, uh, I don't know Obsidian, I don't know Rome, but I understood the conversation about those two. Yeah. And I read through, you know, what everybody had to say. And I thought, and it made a lot of sense to me that when you have certain people, you know, it's just two different mindsets. And I'm not trying to paint one is bad and one is good. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I hope, I, I, yeah, I think starting with the community is important. And I think that you will find in those communities that there already are a lot of women. Yeah. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Cool. And then I would love to figure out which ones and approach them and say, hi, and would you like to play together? That sounds, that sounds perfect. Well, I have one, again, I don't know. I'm just, you know, generalizing up here, yeah. but I noticed she was in OG. I, uh, Somehow I found the Library Society. Oh, sure, Jamie sure. Jamie Joyce. Jamie Joyce. I thought, I thought she'd be interesting to talk to for a number of reasons. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to take you on a tangent right now. No, that's okay. And, and she's part of a group called CDL, Canonical Debate Lab, which Bentley is in, and a couple other people who are in OGM are also in those weekly conversations. They've been working for a while. And I think Canonical Debate Lab is a very weird name, uh, like canonical and debate are just very strange strange words to use, but that's what they do. And, uh, and she's building this big library of society, which I think, I, think, um, <clears throat> I think that conversation would actually be great. So maybe the-, the Something very interesting on, on that site, which actually I, I am gonna go on a tangent a little bit, Cool. Because I had, you know, I had mentioned to Pete, 
it would be really cool as a way to connect if if the goal was to take one idea from every place we visited and you know speak to the people and put it together one of the things i liked about her website is there's a page for volunteer opportunities that you could do in five minutes in 10 minutes or in 15. and i think that's just something that should be you know i think that that could be useful to so many organizations and it's helpful to people too because as we've discussed sometimes people want to you know pitch in or do something they don't know what to do exactly so that's a, that's a weaving activity at its core as far as i'm concerned i completely agree um i do think it's important to speak to the various communities in advance before you invite them into the uh, the first podcast uh, some weaving communities are very authentic, some are very uh, are floating uh, a couple of miles above the atmosphere, some are really technical, some are, so, I mean, you should know who you're inviting in before you invite them in, and then you can structure the episode in that way. Uh, 20, 20 forms of weaving and 21 versions of the truth or however you want to call this it. This could be like, <clears throat> like Kurosawa's run. Yeah, for example, yeah. Or, or yeah. the Alexandria Quartet. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. In, in some sense, we're doing a, a, a little bit of that. I mean, for me, a healthy fungus, a healthy environment will preserve the individual perspective of, of participants and then, and then importantly, we'll make room for them to crystallize parts of what they see into larger collections of, yes, this whole mass over here, these different communities have agreed that we really love this map. This, this piece over here, this chunk of, of, of wisdom really like resonates for, for all of us communities. We don't know about the rest of the world, but, but if you come in and talk to us, we'll point you over there and go, that part's really good. And then yeah. we're trying we're trying to garden the rest of it and, and compost the rest of it so that it tastes as good as that bit over there, yeah. right? And, and, yeah. and I think that's a piece of it. But but for me, really importantly, if I'm going to you know exit Jerry's brain and move to some other medium, I need always to be able to back up and go see only what I put in. Like yeah. like like me having my context is incredibly important to me at this point. Yeah. Um, but. I don't get a shared context at this point, and I'm dying for that. I really want to be able to see, okay, great. Here's how, here's how Stacy sort of organized this set of things. And I'd like to be able to make those connections. And, and it, one, of the, one of the tiles that I'm looking forward to trying to spec and create a project plan for is the tile that says, what does that interaction look like? What does it look like? Yeah. And if Stacy's using a different tool, if she's on Miro or on Rome or, or something else, still, she's got notes and she's curating them in some way that works for her. How do we hold these things up next to each other? And then how do we weave loose hyphae between our works? Yep, very right? good, really good. Yeah. Um, and cool, that, and go ahead, Hank. I was just going to ask, and how, how do you envision a uh, emerging product? that you uh, might want to do something with? Um, so, so I think already, like there's a, there is a trail of um, uh, calls on YouTube that we've got from the 18, 19 months we've been, we've been talking together or 16 months, however long it's been, that, that OGM has had multiple calls. There's a, there's a trail, uh, on YouTube of openly available calls. There are files on a GitHub repository that we've left behind. Uh, my brain, I publish openly on the web, but it doesn't really have a good API or anything. So it's not that open, but it's available. We already have a few artifacts that we're leaving behind in the world. The idea now is to leave more and better artifacts um, that eventually morph into this big fungus because they start to actually be nutritious and connected, right? Because uh, right now they're interesting, and you know, just like the Jim Rutz podcast episode that I that I post processed, yeah. uh, they're interesting and useful. Uh, and that one was a particularly nutritious uh, episode, right? So I got lots of connections, and I learned a lot of stuff, and I started connecting things. 
Um, and so in order to get to a shared memory, we need to do some pioneering and then the whatever tile pieces of code we write, we're gonna put those in the commons so that yeah. other people can go, oh, I'd like to use that too, right? And then, and then together by having these conversations and continuing to do this, I think we'll sort of narrow our way or find our way into a shared environment where we can, where lots and lots and lots of people can be doing this. Yeah. Um, and and uh, there's some magic does have to happen sort of in the middle there somewhere because uh, some of the pieces are simple because we've been talking about all this advanced technology that we can use, you know, Otter and Descript and all those things are like, wow, if, if these things had existed, you know, 15 years ago, all of us would have been completely stunned. <laughs> um, and now they're just like, oh, yep, yeah, here, it's a service. And at most, it's like 15 bucks a month or something like that. And you're off and running. Yeah. Right. So, so how do you use these tools together as openly as possible to create shared knowledge? And then to make that shared knowledge, this is one of the other challenges, to make that shared knowledge as reusable from different tools and different perspectives as possible. Right. So that if someone's coming in looking at it through Rome, or through a wiki interface or something else, they can still access the data and, and navigate around it and maybe add things to it. Um, and I'm I like like at that point, there's there's a couple places here where all I've got is like wishful thinking, uh, yeah. and I can I can talk about what the thing could look like, and I don't know what the state of the art is and how we how we move through that. So we need to focus on that and see who we can invite in to. Uh, to take a bite out of that and if we can collectively fund a bigger project maybe and and i'm sitting here thinking about little tiles and, and, and little projects there's also the perspective of hey can we get a larger amount of money poured into the whole ecosystem so that we can actually attract and this is part of our conversation yesterday and free jerry's brain it was like hey really we kind of need let's pretend a million dollars so that we can actually get up collect up the correct critical mass of people to tackle these bigger problems yeah, I think a piece of our disagreement yesterday was about the scale of the work, because um, there were different approaches about how do we do the minimal thing with just a few people versus how do we attract enough funding to do the bigger thing with more people. And large software projects are really hard to do; they're really complicated. And I, I'm clearly no, you know, large software project manager. Uh, but Marie Bierde used to run software teams at uh, Qualcomm, so she's. You know, she's done that before and she's sort of in our community. She has been on a lot of calls, but I'm talking with her about project management stuff around weaving the web, weaving the world and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it occurred to me that a really nice logo or image for weaving the world would be an actual either wicker or yarn woven globe. Yeah. And if you if you see a photo, if you see a photo of, of, of one of those awesome. And if it, maybe maybe we uh, commission an Etsy crafter to actually crochet a globe or something. I mean, I was like, oh, that'd be really cool. One of the things that I was going to ask you is, and this would serve a dual function because it sort of would be like marketing the show, even though the show hasn't happened yet. I was wondering if you'd want to put out a call for people to submit what they think would be like a great logo. It would give an, a give you know to give an opportunity for artists to contribute and it would be something we could talk about and then to do the same thing with music with the musical intro. Absolutely. Uh, yes and yes. Uh, I haven't put out a call yet. Um, I have one really interesting conversation. It turns out a, a colleague at I have a desk at Ziba, this little design firm. Um, and uh, one of the receptionists, it turns out, ha has an art degree and her background is in textile art. And she sent me a, a keynote presentation that she did kind of as part of her master's thesis. And the first image, the first cover image is of a beautiful piece of textile that has fringy edges. And, and then in, in the middle of it, she's got pencil drawn concept map because she's making connections between woven textiles and concept maps. And then I think she has an image of Indra's net uh, sort of mm -hmm. in the middle as well. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah. if you just recorded a voiceover over this presentation, we could talk for hours about that in OGM. You know, so we'll see. She may she may end up showing up with us, but uh, she also has to she has desk duty during normal work hours. So, um, so yeah. So so I'm like, and I'm and I'm talking with her. She brought some of her work in. We haven't actually had a chance to look at it yet, but I'm I'm hoping to just take some photographs of some of her work and say, you know, 
this piece by Molina Bishop, uh, but but I think that it's completely on point for where we're, where, where we're heading. And, and, and funny enough, she's been thinking about these issues already on her own. You know, she's, she's coming at this. And, and uh, we discovered this because we, we, there were four of us in a car driving to a workshop. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, you know, uh, uh, oops, I spelled that wrong. There. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so those pieces are all happening, which is good. It makes me excited. Um, and we're starting, what we don't have yet is a larger sense of cooperation. I haven't announced this back to the broader OGM community. That's like kind of soon next. Um, I sort of don't want to promote the first couple of shows too much, although I want to make them really good because I'd like to make really good shows and then say, hey, we did this thing, come look at it. Yep. Um, rather than fanfare and premiere and whatever else, uh, it also sort of takes the pressure off of the premiere. I want it. I want us to be able to have some wiggle room leeway, yep. uh, you know, navigational space to to go wherever uh, wherever we go and be a little unusual in what we're doing. Sounds um, really sounds really good. But what what's important? Because I I had a look uh, just before the call at the. Uh, at the project plan, uh, and that would be nice if that got much more complete with uh, a list of uh, forty-seven possible uh, first episodes. And the well, there's a thing. there's a separate spreadsheet for episode ideas. Um, Aha, you'll you'll, no, you'll notice there's a link in the yeah. middle of the document yeah. uh, that points yeah. to a spreadsheet, which right now doesn't have a lot in it. It just has like yeah. fields. But, yeah, but exactly. the, the yeah. idea is to collect up ideas for episodes and, and sort of filter them through. Exactly. I apologize. Okay. I forgot yeah. where, where, where that is and how I find it. Sure, sure, sure. Let me uh, share Sorry. the link again here. Um, intros, outros, weaving the role project plan. Uh, here is a link. Hold on. It has to... My computer has to reload everything because I rebooted this morning because yeah. it was getting really slow and pokey last night. Come on, baby. Wow. There we go. Uh, that's interesting. Why does it not give me the usual I'll share with people in groups? <clears throat> um, well, let me I just add find an old email from because uh, I think we we got like um, I got it, an email invite, so I could probably find it that way. Sort of. I just sent you. I just now added you to the document, though same way Hank is added to the document. Um, but it didn't give me the usual dialogue of uh, people with a link. Now I have it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but you should have access now. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. Good. And um, let me do screen share for a second. Da, da, da. So, uh, Hank, yeah. right here where it says created a schedule spreadsheet. Yeah. Uh, that I think goes here. Is this the schedule? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, here's the here's yeah. here's the spreadsheet, and then Wendy Elford put like Kyle Eggers in, who I don't know, so I need to go yeah. uh, research this. But uh, but here, like uh, the idea is to recommend episodes, and then as we actually choose them and start to execute on them, they would have a, a date uh, and a, okay. and an episode yeah. number. Yeah, right? yeah, right. And I should put in here um, Mila and Gio and Amber, sort of yeah. as uh, guests for an episode. We should pick a title. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That, that should go in here as well. Yeah, and Stacy's uh, idea about uh, uh, connecting other weaving groups together. That I thought that was a powerful idea as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Weaving the weavers or something like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Eleven weavers weaving. <laughs> um. So interesting, all of this. Um, and just, uh, 
it's funny because there's so many people trying to figure out how to fix the world and all that. And, and some piece of all this that we're not tending to, very, we're building it, but we're not tending to it very much in OGM is trust and rebuilding trust. <clears throat> um, and there's a really important piece of the OGM thesis that says that, hey, forget all this technical mappy stuff. Uh, what really matters here is being finding a safe space for a conversation with somebody who thinks very differently from you. Yeah, and and that that's that's on the radar, but it's not really in our work yet. And and I have a feeling that we actually need to work with very friendly, very allied people first to get a rhythm to figure out what this is more. But then we need to go talk to people who aren't like us very much um, and figure out what that means. And one of the one of the videos I watched last night was a video was a i think it was a news hour report or from somewhere uh, that was interviewing uh, white evangelicals who have discovered that if they examine their bible and start thinking about what it means to actually act yeah. in that way that there's just it's just not it doesn't fit what's happening right now with uh, the evangelical conservative right and so they're 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 switching their votes they're they're, they're dropping away from from the party line of the evangelical Christians, which is to back Trump until like everybody jumps off the cliff together. It's just really, really interesting to me um, to, to hear that and to, to sort of model it. And I'm not in conversation with those people, um, but it reminds me, this may be a, a bad analogy, but it's very similar actually. Um, Molly Melching helped reduce the rate of female genital mutilation in West Africa by going to imams uh, in villages and pointing out to them that FGM is actually not in the Quran. Yeah. Yeah. And she's like, you know, it's actually not a practice in the Quran. And, and as you and as we know, as we agree, the Quran is the, the guidebook for everything. So what if, what if you backed off and, and said, we don't need to do this? And, and if the imam sanctions it, then uh, young women who haven't had the procedure done are marriageable. And if he doesn't, he doesn't, they aren't. Right, you could try other workarounds, but mostly the workarounds mean leaving town. You know, if you, if you go to a new environment, maybe maybe then you can have a different context where there's different practices. But but that was working within the constraints of religion very vividly um, to hack the system and change a really brutal practice. Um, so so those are I think those are conversations out ahead in our future someplace. Um, and I'm, I'm likely not the best person to, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I have lots of skepticisms about Christianity and all of that, that, that I'm way too happy to voice, uh, but probably aren't good for starting, for starter conversations about, about those kinds of things. I think we need somebody who's just uh, better informed and, and, uh, than I about it all and can walk into those places and, and hold safe conversations. But some of my heroes are people like Daryl Davis uh, who is the, the jazz pianist who has a garage full of KKK robes because he listened with respect to people who wanted to kill him. Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll find him in my brain so you've got the right spelling. But uh, here's Daryl Davis. Uh, he's under jazz pianists, contrarians who make sense, uh, bridging the cultural divide. Uh, and his question, which is lovely, is how can you hate me when you don't even know me? Yeah. And there's so a I, bunch of, sorry, go ahead, Stacey. I just wanted to ask you, so you have, he's under contrarians who make sense. Yep. Do you have other contrarians that make oh, sense? OMG, Stacey, this is like my most important thought in my brain. And I'm okay. sharing that link with you now, excuse me, in the chat. Okay, I saw that. Okay. Yeah. Good. So contrarians who make or made sense is one of the big light bulbs that went off in my head over the last 20 years. And what I, what, what I realized at some point was, gosh, I've got all these like heroes, like uh, Hans Mondermann, the guy who did traffic calming in the Netherlands is a hero of mine. Alice yes. Miller, who invented, uh, who helped invent family systems therapy and the repetition compulsion and enlightened witnesses and all that kind of stuff. She's one of my heroes. And, and, and if you look through the list, like there's, there's 30, 40 of them or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, and it dawned on me when John Taylor Gatto and uh, uh, Christopher Alexander and a bunch of others. And it dawned on me one day that 
these people were all saying the same thing about their own disciplines. And they were saying, hey, in my discipline, we lost faith in humans. And then that means we went in and we built these control structures to try to control everybody's behavior. And in transportation and urban planning, that means traffic lights, and then a radar gun on the traffic light, and then a camera on the radar gun that automatically sends you a ticket at home. Like every time it doesn't work, we turn the volume up to 11 or 12, right? Instead of, Mondermann says, no, no, no. You actually need to remove all those weird affordances and let people make eye contact as humans again at the intersection, and then they don't kill each other. And the, the throughput is as good as the highway, but you have to do thoughtful redesign of all of these institutions. And that's, that's where design from trust comes from. So my ideas about design from trust, which I've got a lot of, uh, if you go here and you know read the posts and watch the videos, um, all of that comes from my contrarians. And so, and so when, I'm, when I'm saying we should redesign the world from trust, I'm, this is not wishful thinking. This is pointing to a bunch of people who've already been doing this. Don't call it this. Don't know that they have this all in common, right? But here we are. So uh, one of my heroes is Buck Branneman, the horse whisperer. Um, and because animal gentling um, is actually designed from trust. Yeah. yeah. You're, 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 joining up, you're joining up with this, with this creature, this beautiful creature, uh, without breaking it. Like we break horses, right? We break yeah. their will so that they'll serve us. In fact, this is joining up so that we can be in service together and go do stuff. And you can get, and it's really interesting when you do advanced equitage. Uh, so I got, so the reason Melina and I were in a car recently was that Ziba um, sent a bunch of Zbytes uh, over to a woman who does horse training, horse leadership training uh, nearby, half an hour out of, out of Portland. Uh, and one of the really interesting things she said is that to do some of the advanced equitage, you must join up with the horse. You can't force a horse to do some of these moves. You've got to be on the side of the horse. The horse has to be on your side because some yeah. of these steps are really complicated and it's like not going to happen in some coercive way. And I was like, oh, damn. And then and there's just all sorts of interesting lessons from that, from that field. So, so for me, like this, uh, my contrarians are really important because in, in, in some of them are talking about how to rethink policing and, and uh, justice, uh, restorative justice, you know, all those kinds of things are designed from trust. Right. And that, that's the book I haven't written yet that, that I would like to write collaboratively in this space as part of weaving the world. So for me, that's a huge topic area to explore actually. And I'm realizing maybe I should make that more explicit up front. Yeah, what would yeah. you tell me the title of that imaginary book or collaborative? Uh, well, so a design from trust is the topic. Um, the book title that I need to finish is called What If We Trusted You, which is the name of my TEDx talk, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> and I think that would be a fine and dandy title um uh it's a nice umbrella for all of this uh, it implies that we don't trust you which is kind of true right it's, it's a kind of a leading question it implies on the one hand that we don't trust you and we haven't been trusting you and then you're like well what does that mean and i can tell you i can tell you domain by domain by domain by domain and then the question also opens up this positive prospect you know hank this is my positive cartography of, hey, what would happen if we trusted you? How would you rethink or redesign everything? Yep. Right? And so I'm really interested in sort of collaboratively authoring that book as more than a book. But I think one of the artifacts that's been out of it is a book. And I, uh, Stacey, I think you've been on a call and Hank maybe also where I described how books are playlists. Yeah, yeah. So, so for me, for me, a, a, a blog is a playlist, a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation is a playlist, a book is a playlist, and a book is a playlist of chapters, and also conceptually, any chapter is a playlist of paragraphs, for example, right? <clears throat> and so one of the reasons I love what Pete is doing with Massive Wiki and Markdown is that the Markdown file winds up being this really nice primitive element that you can assemble into playlists. <clears throat> and it's really, really easy to write a script the same as the scripts that I'm asking Pete to write to automate production of the podcast, but you can write a script that then fetches, fetch this exact sequence of nuggets, 
string them together in this way, meaning put page numbers on each page, put a chapter headings that look like this, add this theme or style to it so they're pretty, use this font, et cetera. And then at the end, add an ISBN number and spit this out in a Kindle EPUB format. We could do that, right? But, but the reason for me to do it as a playlist, one of the benefits, this isn't just an abstract exercise, one of the benefits of thinking of a book as a playlist is that my chapter three could be your chapter eight. Yeah. And you could include it in time. And if I made the rights so that you could include it and I would be like, yes, please, as opposed to no, I'm going to sue you, which is the default setting. But if I publish this work so that you could rework it, then you could create your narrative that happens to agree only on chapter eight, right? Which, yeah. which, which, which is one of those juicy nuggets we agree we love together. But you could tell a completely different story using that same chapter or three chapters. I don't care, you know, use your imagination. But, but once we start posting nuggets that are weavable into narratives, then we can, I'm interested in three years from now, OGM and other communities publishing 30 books simultaneously. Yeah. So intellectually, I think that we can all agree on that. And I think where we come into, where the problem is, is actually behaving that way in those unconscious behaviors. That's why I'm always so interested. What I've really wanted to see happen is a social setting where games are played to teach that. Like just, for example, um, you know, we're always thinking about collective sense make. I'm just using this as an example because I was yeah. talking to somebody about it yesterday. And I was like, all right. So if we each came up with a list, just a list of 10 things we learn from people, just 10 things that stand out. So like one of mine was when you're walking on ice, don't walk with your hands in your pockets because if you fall, you won't, be, you'll, you, know, you won't be able to catch yourself. Another one, if you're driving, in, you're gonna make a left to cross a highway, don't turn your wheel until you're ready to move. Because, because if, if somebody, somebody bumps you from behind, you're dead. So I used to joke because those were two things my dad taught me, but uh -huh. then there were other little things. And as I was telling my friend, she was like, yeah, that would be really fun because you know, I want to hear your 10 things. Hank, I want to hear your 10 things. And after you get to the first four, then some inner work starts happening because then you got to really go in and like, what are the little things that I never, I never realized were such a big deal that become a big deal. And it reminds you of people that you've met along the way. It might've just been a stranger at a supermarket. And that, again, I'm saying a social setting because you see in all these calls, we'll come sometimes to do work and we go, we default to the social part, which means there's a need for it and a desire for it. And instead of saying, no, we can't do this, we have to get to work, let's use it. Because it's, it's, it's a good, um, I don't know, my friend pointed out to me that these are all group building activities. And I'm like, yeah, I guess, I guess that's kind of what I'm about or what I'd like to do or be part of or where I feel I could contribute. Um, so yes, 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 and yes. And I just went to life advice in my brain, which is where I collect up all these tips for living well. Here's, an, here's an, uh, a post by Leo Babara, 12 Essential Rules to Live More Like a Zen Monk. It's under yeah. Zen, Zen Habits, which is his blog. It's under Enumerated Wisdom because it's 12. It's got a number, uh, but it's under Life Advice uh, where it's next to all these other things, right? Uh, and, and so when I find something like what you just described, um, I, I add it here. So I have, I have, and this is a scroll bar. So we're just at the beginning of, this is A through F, right? Of this list. So I've got a, whole mess of this that I keep that is kind of accessible but not accessible because you could if you knew of the existence of this thought you could browse around at your heart's content and you could read the articles you could do whatever else but nobody knows this exists right, right. but here here's what I'm getting at the only people that care about what the ordinary person has to say not somebody that has a book or a podcast are people that are gonna take their information and use it. Mm -hmm. They're extracting it from them, not for their own good. I'm looking for a situation where people are giving the ordinary person an opportunity to contribute 
and that person contributing is getting something back. Right. It's not that info isn't being taken to be used against them. It's helping them to connect and to feel. Like, I thought about it and I was like, you know, I've had people say, what can I do to help you? And for me, just as a person, the best thing you could do to make me feel comfortable in a room is ask me a question that you really care about my answer. Right. That's for me. For somebody right. else, that is not what they want at all. Right. Because they don't want the spotlight or something. Whatever reason. Whatever reason. Or, they might, but there, but there might come a time when they do want it. So always leave that door open. Yep. 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 But again, totally. looking for contribution because that's the dynamics that I think made Facebook successful. Yeah, yeah. agreed. And the the other thing I wanted to add to what you were just saying was, I'm not really good at game design, and gamification is a word that makes me cringe a little bit. Um, so I am very interested in how to make and play is a word I adore. That's the word I mean to use, by the and, way. I was and, just going to type it. Okay, okay. Um, and so turning this into play yes. and, and creating and maybe creating several different kinds of frames of play with ideas would be a brilliant thing to do in weaving the world. Yay! That's what and, I want to hear. And, and so maybe you can be sort of like a game master ish. Well, let's um, try. Help me say play because I yeah. really do mean play and I want to get back to that. Uh, thank you. And, 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 and just for me, and this is only my biases, the word play is much easier to hear than game. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And being playful and having a playmaster or somebody who says, okay, okay, this is, this is how we'll organize ourselves for this next piece of play um, is brilliant. And, and, and if we can do that and lather, rinse, repeat, and, and like digest the world into more usable um, insights from people who are having fun doing so, then we're on our way. And that's contagious. And that's, I think that's the goal is to, to make a, a playful sharing of wisdom contagious. Well, something that I think would be playful, that I think we could try it out on any call, is to take, the to take a transcript of the call and everybody hone in on like one thing that was <laughs> of particular interest. We don't have to act on it but just look at it and see if any of us pick the same things yeah. and then maybe form three groups of whichever and approach it from there. So like, even when you were talking about the podcast, I was thinking it might be playful and it, yeah. it does. I don't want to make it sound competitive because it's not. Yep. So it's, it, it's more like a mission with maybe more than one track. If everybody wants to do it the same way, then fine. But if somebody has a different angle, maybe have the opportunity to play together and create three different versions of a podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so one easy way to fold this into the current plan, uh, because we're going to have episodes and then we're going to post-process the episodes, is part of the setup for the post is, hey, go look at the transcript, reflect on the call, and, and pick the two or three your, of your favorite nuggets that happened during the call. And then we sort people into breakouts, depending on which nugget, and then we, we let them loose with whatever tools or whatever means they want to just discuss, to, to, to weave, to, to do whatever um, with those. Uh, and then we're, then we're sort of dividing and conquering a little bit too. I'm also wondering if it may not be worthwhile to have a short pre-call just to, just to get some more input onto what people really want to know. That's true. Um, that's very true. And that could well be part of our rhythm. Um, because I know that the standard format, like, you know, uh, Jim Rutt in prep for his show with Dunbar had clearly read the book Friends, uh, you know, had a lot of background on Dunbar, uh, and they were able to do a good, a good traditional interview because of that, right? There was a, a lot of ground to go into. And occasionally during the podcast, you're like, and, and Jim Rutt would say, oh, and, you know, you talk a lot about the seven principles of friendship and whatever, let's, let's go there. And then you talk about how relationships end, let's end with that. So, so he's just sort of mapping it to this new book and Dunbar is doing publicity tour for his book. So he's on board and, and Rudd is a really good interviewer. Um, so differently from that, we could sort of crowdsource what we're interested in and what like, like for this upcoming call that we're framing, what's the background. And then for me, what I do is I, I, I sort of prepare the ground in, in my brain, right? Um, because I'm, I'm, 
by the time the call starts, I've already got some assumptions and some things woven together and potentially even also the questions to ask could easily be in my brain, right? Did you read, did you read the comment that I wrote back to you regarding um, Kevin's project? I think so. I'm pretty sure I read it. I'm forgetting what you said. I, I, I was talking about uh, the benefit of sometimes not knowing too much about a subject in that if we're creating something that we're actually going to watch, which I, I'm hoping we create something that we're excited to watch because if yeah. we want to watch it, then yeah. we know it's good. And again, we're it's a community. Um, and I was thinking exactly. that 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 could that type of thing could be a way to play because then we can kind of together source the what it is we already know, who the people are that are doing similar things, like a pre kind of information gathering so that we're all doing it together it's cool. sort of like the book you want to collaborate on except we'd be trying out those processes with podcasts exactly exactly um cool um we've run over our time this has been really fruitful anything we want to add to where we are um <clears throat> i think most of what was said in the last half an hour is really terrific. And let's see what we can make actionable. I took two of the ideas that we more or less all three thought were cool and added them to the, uh, uh, the Excel sheet. But in my own notes uh, that I take based on what's in the chat, I saw so many links to other work that I'm doing. And I could imagine any of those suggestions, uh, 10 things you learn from other people, uh, one great idea from every other weaving community, uh, uh, nuggets from any particular call and discussing them in smaller groups are ways to vary these weekly calls, which might inspire even more people in OGM to take part in it. And I'm always wondering if you, if you think that in, I'm not in the Thursday calls or the flotilla calls, but in the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday calls, it's a group of about 20 people. And uh, on the, uh, uh, the, the list of uh, OGM, there's a, group of another 20 people active, not too much intersection. Right. But there, mu there must be really lots of people in OGM who are bored to tears with their normal Zoom work and are looking, looking to, to, to feed themselves or, 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 or get terrific new inspirations from people they don't know but respect because they're also in OGM. So I, I think that'd be great stuff to, to do in, a, in the next uh, couple of weeks. So okay. if, I could just, if I could just add to that, because now I feel like I can share. One of the ideas that I've had is something, I don't know if it's called common play or play school, but it's sort of creating this framework where we have weaving the world and all those episodes and all the people that have their books out they could be responsible for a block of time and other people that, you know, like if, if I want to just have a social group talking about, you know, the 10, the 10 things or just having all these blocks of time, like a network, that's been the dream since 2015. <laughs> um, so again, but I, like I said, common play, it, it has to be play in it and a play school. And we're not, so the last thing I will say is it regards the power dynamics. Many people want to teach others what they know and they've forgotten the joy that they had about learning. So I want to bring back where we're learning together and discovering together because that is the mm -hmm. joy, mm -hmm. not Agreed. telling other people what we've learned. Thank you, Stacey. Totally Thank agree. <laughs> Totally agree. Um, okay, feels like feels like lots of good stuff and a good point to pause. This um, was nice.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I hope that asteroid does not kill you, Hank. Uh, it's, it's sort of en passant, passing, passing by. Nice. It'll just make a loud noise, that's all. Yeah, and <clears throat> perhaps a uh, light, nice light show. And we all like a nice light show. <laughs> exactly. Sweet. <clears throat> tomorrow. Thank you very much. Yeah, see yeah. you tomorrow. And see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Exactly.